Now, how do you test personality? We've been talking about testing almost since the beginning. We got into biology and then we got into talking about some constructs and how to operationalize those in the research part of that first section of material. How do you measure stuff in psychology? Are we really a soft science that we don't really touch on anything that's real? No, we're a difficult science because the things we try to understand are very difficult to measure. Given great precision, science advances rapidly. Given total imprecision, you have no science at all. In the middle, and leaning towards greater precision, at least in spirit, we have sciences that are in the social sciences, and we lean towards the hard sciences as a discipline. Because what we try to do is to measure with the greatest precision possible constructs that are hard to measure. Doesn't mean they don't exist because they're hard to measure. It means you have to be creative, but not just creative. You have to be willing to let go of theories and hypotheses when the data refutes what you believe to be the case. So you're refining knowledge. Objective tests are one way to measure personality traits. Now I've got them on white font and asterisk because one of the strengths of an objective test is that it has, generally speaking, good reliability and good validity, and it's easy to determine whether it has good reliability. It's a little less easy to determine if it's valid, but it's determinable. In the same way when we looked at IQ testing, right? If you test high on IQ, you would expect that to predict certain kinds of outcomes in terms of somebody's ability to do or not do certain kinds of abstract intellectual work or when we got into Gardner's multiple intelligences, whether they could do music or not music, or they understood bodily movements or didn't really, they were really clumsy, versus kind of the traditional things that we measure with intelligence tests which map onto academic work. So if you score high or low, that should predict certain kinds of outcomes, and if it does predict the predicted outcomes, then it's probably valid. And if it's valid, it should be reliable, right? But if it's reliable, it does not necessarily mean it's valid. So one of the nice things about objective tests is they're empirically keyed and they are self-report. You're measuring everybody on the same standard, which enables comparisons. However, there are some problems. You've taken these studies on SONA, right? Most of you have taken at least one of these online studies. Well, that's what they're measuring, various kinds of self-reported information to see how things relate to one another. Well, when you have somebody ask you questions about your personality, are you really, do you like to go to parties, very much like me, very much not like me, uh, true, false, uh, strongly agree, strongly disagree. When you have everybody looking at the same stimulus, they're then introspecting. That thing we talked about with Wilhelm Wundt so long ago, right? I don't know. Me? Hmm. Neutral. A little bit yes, maybe a little bit no. Each person is now empirically responding to the same stimulus, right? And if they're being totally honest with themselves and with the measure, then you have excellent reliability and probable good validity, and you have an ability to discern relationships as they exist or determine when they don't exist, or when one variable modifies or uh, modulates another variable mediates or moderates another variable. But one of the problems with these is that they're subject to deliberate deception. So that's really nice. You're taking a study on SONA and it says your data is confidential and your privacy is valued. You can be as honest as possible. Please be as honest as possible, right? Because that helps us gain precision and validity. But what if I got a conscientiousness measure, for example? Do you follow the rules? Do you steal? Right? Do you ever take office supplies and you know, strongly disagree or true false, right? No, never. Well, if I go out and try to give that conscientiousness measure to prospective employees and it says things are, are you an honest employee? Yeah, yes or no. Or I am an honest employee. Strongly agree to strongly disagree. What are you going to answer if you try to get a job? Of course I'm a good employee. Of course, I never steal. I never do anything wrong. I always follow the rules. I'm a great employee. So you can just lie on these. You got to be careful because a lot of people will take research measures and take them out into the real world and just assume everybody's going to be honest, but not everybody scores high on conscientiousness, right? 
Guess who would be most honest? Those who actually score highest on conscientiousness. The people who are scoring low on it be like, I'll tell you whatever I think you need to hear to get what I need out of this, right? So deliberate deception. Social desirability bias. People tend to, this is not a lie, they tend to believe themselves to be better than perhaps they are objectively warranted in calling themselves. So we look at people and you ask, for example, uh, are you above average, average, or below average on honesty? And you see about 90% of people think they're above average, right? But you can't have 94% of people be above average. Does that make sense? But it's not that they're lying. They just tend to see themselves. What is above average? That's just a, it's just a stem, an item. You see it and you get three choices. People tend to skew themselves toward the positive. So in other words, they're not completely objective with themselves, which is one of the problems with introspection, right? People are subjective with themselves. Now some people, very few, relatively speaking, actually characteristically see themselves toward the negative. They bias themselves on the downside, but more often than not, people bias themselves toward the upside of anything that they see as socially desirable. And you got response sets. Please don't go through Sona going, agree, 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 give me my credit. And don't tell anybody anything. All it does is screw up the research. But you can see how it would be easy to do that. I work with a colleague who does screening for, let's just say, a nuclear facility in the vicinity where you have to go through psychological screening to get a job. And this person got given a very, very long screening measure. The screening measure that was given was the MMPI, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the most widely used clinical personality assessment inventory. It's got 567 statements on it. That's a lot of statements to read. And then you answer true or false. Now, if you answer true or false on any one statement, what does that tell you about somebody's personality? Virtually nothing. But when we aggregate factor after factor after factor after factor, lots and lots and lots of items on lots and lots and lots of different measures, we start to approach a pretty good picture of a trait or a characteristic. What happened with this fella is he got bored and he didn't think this really mattered. And so he just started going down the down the thing, just putting stuff in randomly, he said. But he got flagged because it turns out it's got validity scales built into it. And it tells you when somebody's faking bad or faking good or has a really bizarre profile that's not something we can have any confidence in whatsoever. Right? So you might spike high or you might be low on various traits, but if you just fill in stuff randomly, this measure will know because guess what? 567 items, some of them are redundant. But when you get to item 13 and it says, you know, I enjoy parties, true. And you get to item 432 and it says, I hate parties. To be consistent, you'd have to put false, right? Because you said true to loving them, so hating them, you'd have to say that's not like me. So guess what? People who are filling in things randomly don't catch things like that. And did it matter? Yeah. He wasn't going to get a job. But my colleague said, let's talk to this person. Talk to the person. And my colleague, she said, what were you doing? He said, I just got really bored. There's a lot of paperwork and I just didn't think that mattered. And she's like, well, only if you want a job does it matter. And he's like, oh, I want a job. And she's like, well, let's let you do it again. And he had to do the whole thing again. And then we were able to see that, yes, he was fine. Just as he conjectured that he was fine. I also worked at, uh, as a, oh uh, well. Y'all have a great weekend. Buckstock is tonight and tomorrow and Sunday. Get out there and enjoy your buck entertainment. Last class we talked about objective tests, objective personality tests. And I wanted to just finish up talking about the MMPI, which you would want to know, of course, for your test. 
as the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. It's a long term, but MMPI makes it easy to remember, and that's how most people know it. And I was talking about validity scales and how you know whether you are actually measuring what you think you're measuring. And in fact, I had this experience by chance where I was a, an instructional league coach for baseball at, here in Johnson City, and we had to get training, and it was conducted by an EMT. So we were doing CPR training. It was a pretty cool thing to be able to do. And uh, by chance, I was sitting there, and the EMT starts talking about some experiences he'd had where he had to do some, some testing, some psychological testing. And I didn't tell. I don't tell people I'm a psychologist. It's irrelevant. When I'm coaching baseball, I'm coaching baseball. Uh, so I'm in there doing my training like everybody else and he starts talking about the psychological test that he had to go through as part of his job and he said you know when I got done with it they said I was crazy and I said what and uh, I, and they said well you know they talked to me some more and like what kind of job do you do and they're like I'm an EMT the guy said I'm an EMT and they said oh well, we need to rescore it then and they go back and they rescore it and he says hey come back and tell me I'm perfectly normal he goes, that shows you what a bunch of BS that is. And I, at that point, I couldn't help myself. I raised my hand. I'm like, I, actually, that shows you how good it is. Because the fact that you rescored it based on your profession, which indicates something about your personality, change the outcome, tells you a little something about the validity. So the first time you look at this, this test and it asks you all kinds of questions. So most people run from tragedies. They don't run into tragedies. They run away from things that are dangerous or threatening or gory. And EMTs by definition, police, fire personnel, they run towards it, right? So this takes a certain kind of personality to do that. And if you're gonna have somebody who does that characteristically, they're going to score in a very odd direction on certain scales of something like the MMPI. However, when you look, and if you'll remember norms, we talked about getting a standardization sample. If you look at the norms for people who do that kind of work, then he's perfectly normal, which actually demonstrated the validity of the test, not the invalidity, which is as a layperson is what he took it to be. And of course, I know they didn't tell him he was crazy. They probably said you spiked on a couple of scales which make us give us pause for concern. They had a conversation, they rescored it, and they said, ah, within this norm, you're perfectly well within parameters that we would consider normal. So that's a, a way of showing the validity of some psychological tests. Uh, there are lots and lots and lots of, of personality tests. Uh, not all of them are very good. Most of the ones you see in magazines are total bunk. In other words, they haven't been developed systematically. They haven't been tested and normed on a standardized sample. They don't give you means and standard deviations. They don't give you, they give you scoring cutoffs, but they make those up. Uh, to have a true, valid, reliable measure, you go through a very rigorous process, and then you don't stick that into magazines. It's something that should be done by professionals and interpreted by professionals and be um, used very carefully in a holistic assessment of people's lives, not just a number. You can't reduce people to numbers. Another one to remember is based on the big five model of personality, which we talked about, right, just the other day. The big five model is called the five-factor inventory, and it's uh, by Costa and McRae. And there's many, many, many others, but you don't need to know them all. I just wanted to give you a sense that there are plenty of them out there. 